Now, I want to make this startling statement. The book of Revelation is not a difficult book. The liberal has tried to make it that kind of book. And then even the amillennialist has attempted to say that, that it's a difficult book. It's symbolic. It's hard and difficult to understand. And, of course, some of our premillennialists are trying to demonstrate that it's a weird and wild book. Actually, it's not a difficult book. It's the most orderly book in the Bible. And there really is no reason to misunderstand it. First of all, let me say that no book of the Bible, and we'll deal with this as we go along, is as orderly as the book of Revelation. Now, this is what I mean. It divides itself, as we shall see. John puts down, He says, you're to write of the things you have seen, the things that are, and the things that will be, past, present, and future. Then you will find that the book divides itself as no other book does in a series of sevens. And each one is just as orderly as it possibly can be. And you'll find no book in the Bible that divides itself like that. And as we get into the book, we're going to demonstrate it. And then there are those that claim that all of it is symbolic, and you just really can't understand it. It's just beyond us. May I say to you that the book of Revelation is to be taken literally. And when it's a symbol, it'll be either indicated or so stated, and it will be symbolic of reality and the reality will be more real than the symbol for the simple reason he uses a symbol to describe a reality. And that's important. In fact, that's all important to follow. Now, because of this, we have no right to reach into the book of Revelation and to draw out of it some of these wonderful pictures that John gives us and some of them actually symbolic, but symbolic of a reality, but not of a reality taking place today. Because let me say something else, and then we'll develop this later on. The book of Revelation is prophetic of the future. When it was given, all of it was prophetic. And all of it looked to the future, even beginning with the glorified, resurrected Christ. He saw him as he is today, but that was the vision he was given. And since he'd been given the vision, he was to write of that vision, which was. But it's of the Lord Jesus Christ as he is today. So that the church is set before us in the figure of seven churches that actually were in existence, real churches. I've visited all seven of them. And I have spent many hours there, for I've visited them, some of them as many as four times, and I'd love to go back there tomorrow because it's a very wonderful thing, and it makes these churches live for us today to see the ruins of them and to see how John was speaking in to a local situation but giving the history of the church. Then at the beginning of chapter 4, The church is not mentioned anymore. In fact, will not be mentioned again in the book of Revelation. Somebody says, you mean it goes out of business? Well, it leaves the earth and goes to heaven. Well, what happened to it? Well, it became the bride of Christ. And you're going to see a bride in the last part of Revelation, but not the church. She's a bride now to be presented to Christ. What a picture. And then... Beginning with chapter 4, everything is definitely in the future from where we are right now. So that when anybody reaches in and tries to pull out a revelation, some vision about famine or wars or that sort of thing, my friend, it just doesn't fit today. And if we'll let John tell it like it is, and I tell you, We need to let the Bible speak like that. Just let it say what it wants to say. And this idea of drawing these weird and wild interpretations, and that's the reason I enter this book 
with a great deal of fear and trembling. The interesting thing to note is that prophecy is being developed today. The great doctrines of the church have been developed in certain ages. At first, it was the doctrine of the Scripture, of the Word of God. Then there was the doctrine of the person of Christ, Christology. And then the doctrine of soteriology, of salvation. And then on down. And now we're living in the day when prophecy is really being developed. And we need to be very careful of who we listen to and what we listen to. When the pilgrims sailed for America, their pastor at Leyden, that is in Holland, reminded them, and I'm quoting from him now, the Lord has more truth yet to break forth from his holy word. Luther and Calvin were shining lights in their times, yet they penetrated not the whole counsel of God. Be ready to receive whatever truth shall be made known to you from the written word of God. That's important. God today is not revealing new truth by giving you a vision or a dream or a new religion. But God is revealing new truth from His Word. And therefore, we need to be very careful of what it is. The 20th century has witnessed, as we've indicated, a renewed interest in eschatology. Now, that's the doctrine of last things, or as the common colloquialism is, prophecy especially since World War I. Great strides have been made in the field of prophecy during the past two decades. Indeed, new light has fallen upon this phase of Scripture. All of this attention has focused the light of deeper study on the book of Revelation. Even in this series that will take us three months, we are going to try to avoid the pitfalls of attempting to present something new and novel just for the sake of being different. Likewise, we shall steer clear of repeating threadbare cliches. Many works on Revelation are merely a carbon copy of other works. I have more books on Revelation in my library than I have on any other book of the Bible and most of them just didn't need to be written because they're nothing in the world but just a Xerox copy of the one that was written before them. I say that realizing that I have two volumes on Revelation, Reveling Through Revelation, two volumes. 